Okay, so uh, welcome everyone to attend uh, our second seminar of HVE Comsoc SPS ISAC webinar series. And uh, this is our second season. And um, so today we have two guest speakers, uh, Professor Chris Massors from University College London and Professor uh, Wei Yu from the uh, University of Toronto. And uh, so before we uh, begin the uh, um, presentation, I would like to uh, advertise a bit about our recent uh, couple papers of two special issues of our ISAC ETI. One is uh, actually a uh, special issue on integrated sensing communications for future green networks uh, on actually TGCN, so transactions on green communications and networking. And uh, the submission deadline will be uh, uh, the 15th of June of this year. And the next uh, uh, couple of paper is on uh, actually open journal of communication society, which is also focusing on ISAC for multifunctional networks in 60 era. And the deadline will be May the 15th of this year. Okay. So I would like to uh, give a brief introduction to our first speaker, Professor Christos Masoros, and uh, who is who has been my uh, postdoc supervisor and a very good friend. So I knew uh, Christos since I think uh, 2016. And uh, so Christos is now a full professor at uh, uh, University College London and uh, working in signal processing and wireless communications. So his research interests lie in the field, uh, in particular on green communications, large scale antenna systems, and of course, integrated sensor and communications and interference mitigation techniques for MIMO and multi-carrier communications. And he has uh, received uh, numerous uh, paper, best paper awards, including the uh, H3 SPS Young Arthur Best Paper Award, and uh, the best paper was uh, from Globcom and WCNC and has been recognized as ex uh, exemplary editor and exemplary reviewer for several HV transactions and journals. And he is an editor for HV TCOM, HV TWC, HV OJSP, and uh, editor at large for HV OJCOMS. And he was an associate editor for HV Communication Matters. And uh, he has uh, acted as a guest editor for a number of special issues on actually GSEC and actually GSTSP. And uh, he is a founding member and the vice chair of our actually ISAC ETI. And he's also the vice chair of actually SIG on ISAC and chair of the uh, actually SIG on energy harvesting communication networks. Uh, so before we uh, uh, beginning our presentation, I would like to remind you again that uh, during the seminar, our audiences will be muted. And uh, please do not uh, annotate on your screen. Uh, please type your questions and send them to host or co host, so me or Yuan Hao. And we will collect uh, all the questions from audiences from Zoom and off site live broadcasting. And during the uh, QA, we'll choose uh, three to five questions and uh, you will be named and uh, you are encouraged to ask questions by yourself. Okay, so that'll be all for my uh, introduction. And uh, so Christos, we all look forward to your wonderful presentation. Great, thanks a lot, Fan. Uh, let me start by sharing my screen. Yeah, I'll stop uh, sharing. Okay. I hope you guys can see this. Yeah, 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 perfect. Okay, great. Uh, so thanks a lot, uh, Fan, for the introduction, and thanks a lot to to the whole ATI for for invite me to uh, to give this talk. It's always a pleasure to talk about integrated sensing and communications. Um, so what I will be talking about is uh, is this very topic. I, I'd like to give some extensions related to security, which I think are unique uh, for this topic. Uh, but also some broader, uh, uh, you know, discussion on on signaling and wave from design for the integrated communication and sensing. Uh, I have to say, um, as Fan mentioned, he he was in my group for for some time, and a lot of this work actually has been 
led by Fan and his colleagues uh, in, in my group. So I'd, I'd like to acknowledge them for, for their work in this. Uh, just to start off with a bit of motivation, uh, to my observation, you know, this area of integrated sensing and communications has started uh, by the observation that uh, you know, radar and communication systems are seeing an increasing uh, cohabitation of, of uh, common frequency bands. So uh, low gigahertz bands that are traditionally used for air traffic control radars and big radars, surveillance radars, and so on, have seen increasing, uh, you know, use from uh, conventional, sorry, commercial communication systems such as 4G LTE and now 5G new radio. But also this uh, is expected to expand in the millimeter wave bands where smaller radars such as automotive radars will be um, uh, coexisting with new uh, frequency bands of uh, 5G radios. Uh, so uh, the classical approach to addressing this um, uh, you know, coexistence has been uh, uh, you know, spectrum sharing techniques between radar and communications, borrowing ideas from communications uh, system spectral coexistence. And, and the main limitation here is interference and the need to address interference. So you have interference from the communication transmission to the radar receiver when it's receiving its echoes and from the radar transmitter to the communication receivers. And here's a, 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 an elementary example. So dealing with this interference requires uh, synchronization, requires these two different systems to coordinate. Uh, it can include overheads in the transmission. And it's also a bit risky when you have radar critical applications where you cannot tolerate any communication interference. Uh, you cannot tolerate errors, let's say in the coordination or communication critical operations, again, where you cannot tolerate uh, any interference. So it has its limitations. Uh, and there's other uh, you know, motivating factors um, that you know, the coexistence alone does not really address. So challenges include, uh, for example, having the, the, this growing population of sensors and transceivers for communications and sensing. And here's an example from, uh, from uh, let's say, civilian applications. So this is a classical field where this applies to so connected vehicles. So connected vehicles will be expected to communicate with different means of communications, vehicle to vehicle, vehicle to infrastructure, vehicle to pedestrian, vehicle to device, and so on. And at the same time, they're equipped with a number of sensors uh, including cameras and LIDAR, but also a number of uh, uh, different radars, long, medium, and short range radars for different applications. So cruise control, uh, traffic alert, anti-collision uh, alert, uh, pre-crash, parking assistance, and, and quite a few others. So there's this growing population of sensors in the connected vehicle uh, technology. And there, there, is, there is definitely scope in trying to uh, you know, make this a little bit more sustainable and trying to merge uh, you know, com different communication and sensing devices. We've seen this highlighted a lot also in the military domain where the complaint there is there's too many uh, RF systems and the numbers are growing and the sizes are growing. So you have RF systems for communications, friendly communications or enemy jamming, enemy intercept, uh, also sensing, sensing attacks, sensing threats, sensing and mapping the environment and quite a few others. So different types of communications and sensing functionalities, different types of platforms. And as you tend to increase the requirements from these platforms, the performance requirements, these platforms tend to increase in, in size, uh, in weight, in uh, area, and so on. Uh, so growing, having all these uh, platforms growing at the same time is not really uh, sustainable. So there's been a drive uh, uh, to explore whether uh, you know, these radar and communication systems, the separate platforms could be uh, merged. And that's where this uh, concept of dual functional radar and communication system comes in. So I, I see it as a step change from the classical comms radar coexistence. So where before you had the communication and radar systems uh, competing for the same resources, frequency, power, uh, and so on. Now you have one device doing two things. Uh, so doing both communications and sensing with uh, a single bit of hardware, a common infrastructure, and a, signal, a single uh, signaling, right? So uh, uh, one way from one signal that at the same time uh, communicates uh, to a number of users, while at the same time the same waveform is good for uh, detecting or tracking uh, different targets. There's obvious benefits in terms of making uh, this, this business, let's say, more hardware uh, efficient, more power efficient. Now you have one device uh, doing both things. So it was, it, you know, it, uh, there's one device consuming power. 
is also cost efficient. And uh, going beyond these, you can now make these, um, this operation by you know, having the operation coming from the same device, you can make it um, uh, mutually benefit uh, both the functionalities, the radar functionality and the communication functionality. And if we think uh, on a, a, let's say a system level, and if we imagine now with the expansion of uh, 5G base stations and the, uh, the, uh, the dense deployment of base stations, uh, small base stations being deployed on uh, street furniture like lampposts, uh, walls, sides of buildings, and so on. Uh, and if you can now assume these base stations being dual, dual functional, then you have a, a communication or wireless infrastructure that's no longer just doing wireless communications, but also sensing and smart city applications, such as incident detection that you have here, uh, monitoring, uh, you know, uh, security, critical infrastructures, urban security and threat detection, uh, and, and many uh, others. And there's this opportunity through the, the communication infrastructure to make radar a commodity. So not just anymore the big radars, you know, the park hungry consuming radars, but radar and sensing functionalities through the communication infrastructure. Uh, so just to outline uh, a number of gains that, are, that uh, we see in this technology, obviously, as I mentioned, there's this hardware gain where before you had two separate systems, so a, a communication system and a radar system. Now you have, let's say, a dual, a super, let's say, access point that can do both things at the same time. Obviously, that has, as I mentioned, savings in power, savings in, in hardware complexity, and so on. There's also this spectrum gain, which is in line with the coexistence scenarios, where before you had separate uh, uh, spectra for radar and for communications, coexisting with a million other applications. Now you can have you know, through a single transmission, both of them uh, coexisting in the same uh, frequency in the same resources and make space for uh, other um, applications that are frequency or spectrum uh, demanding. Beyond, however, these, once you now co-design these two systems, the communications and the seismic system, you can design uh, flexible trade-offs between them. So you can design a system, uh, an access point that goes all the way from full radar uh, uh, centric applications so full radar performance to full communication uh, performance and all the way in between. And going beyond, you can come up with new synergies between radar and communications, which are difficult to implement when these systems are separate. So sensing assisted communications, and we'll, we'll see an example later on, uh, and communication assisted sensing. And also I'll try to highlight um, the importance of uh, having these synergies between uh, sensing communications and security, both communication security and sensing security. In terms of signaling, uh, we, we typically classify the dual functional radar and communication signaling technologies into three main categories. We have the radar centric design where the basic principle is shown here. You, have, you take basically a, a radar waveform, a known radar waveform that is well designed to do a, a radar task and uh, you try to modulate information on top of that waveform. And that will give you a radar-centric approach where uh, hopefully the radar functionality remains unchanged or uh, uh, has very small, let's say, penalties while you're able to convey information through uh, the, this uh, radar waveform. And there's a number of uh, works um, in, in the area, starting from pulse interval modulation, which we now think was the first, uh, let's say, uh, approach ever in history in the 1960s to, to uh, try to uh, merge radar and communication transmission, but also modulating information in the side lobes of the radar beam pattern uh, or other general index modulation uh, approaches. And I will be showing some recent results we have in, in, in this area. Uh, a second uh, approach is this communication centric design, so the reciprocal approach where you take a communication waveform, a waveform that's designed for communications, OFDM and so on, and you try to use that uh, for radar detection. Uh, so use the same waveform as your reference waveform and, and apply uh, classical radar uh, uh, processing to extract information about targets, detect targets or uh, track the parameters of targets. And there are actually some uh, communications waveforms such as uh, the pilot signaling and the preambles in, in the frames, where, which are very well suited for um, uh, radar processing. So these two categories are 
the benefit of these are that you make minimal changes to classical signaling and waveforms, either the radar communications. So they would be, let's say, more suitable to, to apply, let's say, immediately in, uh, and more standards relevant. But they have a limitation in the sense that uh, the radar waveform is not designed for communications, for signaling exchange. The communication waveform is not designed for radar detection. So they have limitations. They're difficult. The performance is difficult to tune. The, the, the wafers are difficult, difficult to, to make explicit trade-offs between uh, the two functionalities. And that's where this new, uh, the third category of design comes in. So jointly optimized design, where, as I said, you design a new way from, from the start so that it's good for both radar and communications, so that it can provide you with a flexible trade-off between radar and communications, so that it can provide you the high rates that you need for communications and also the reliability you need for uh, radar detection. And that will be basically the main focus uh, of, of my uh, discussion today. So um, having uh, done with the, with the motivation, uh, I'll try uh, time allowing to, to uh, basically highlight um, a number of technical uh, advances from, uh, that come from our, from our group here in UCL. So I'll start with um, overviewing some recent experiments on a radar-centric uh, based uh, DFRC design. Uh, then I'll move on to this joint DFRC design that I mentioned, uh, and I'll, I'll show an example uh, how this can be done through weighted optimization. Uh, I'll, show, I'll show how this can be expanded to, to make hardware efficient uh, DFRC waveforms and signaling. And then I'd like to highlight uh, the issues of security for DFRC, which I think are unique, and a couple of solutions um, that are tailored to DFRC uh, systems. I'll finish off with uh, more like a use case of DFRC in, in a sensing-assisted uh, communication scenario where basically the sensing assists uh, the, the establishment of a communication link uh, in a high mobility scenario. And I think this well links uh, with what uh, I understand Wei uh, is going to talk about later on. So first of all, the, the radar-centric uh, design. So our radar-centric design, uh, you know, the recent study has been trying to apply this uh, in the lab and doing some experiments uh, and, and basically convincing ourselves that this can be done uh, over the air. And we've taken a, an approach based on index modulation. Probably the best place to, to read about index modulation for comms radar is this uh, uh, paper over here, um, two years old uh, by now, where a, a DFRC approach is taken uh, using a MIMO radar so multi-antenna uh, radar uh, and FIR radar, and uh, uh, information is modulated on the indices of the antennas that are transmitting and on the frequencies that are transmitting. So having a combination of different frequencies and different antennas to transmit from, so here's an example of two antennas and four frequencies, that gives you the size of your constellation. So hit this example gives you a constellation of eight uh, points, which in turn will give you three bits of information. So by changing the antennas and the frequencies that you uh, transmit from, you have the different uh, information bits being conveyed. And you can calculate the spectral efficiency, so how many bits per symbol you can transmit for this approach. Uh, in our approach, so we're, we're based on, uh, so this is worked together with our radar team in, in our radar lab. And this is a setup. So the setup basically involves, uh, uh, essentially we're using a radar um, RF uh, system on chip platform that's been developed in our radar group, which doesn't have MIMO capability, but it can uh, transmit on different uh, um, um, uh, sorry different frequencies and different polarizations, uh, and we use these indices to to basically convey information. So uh, this is our setup. This is our radar transmitter and receiver. This is our emulated target. And here we have a communication receiver that is controlled by this uh, RF system on chip um, from, uh, that's been developed uh, in our radar group. And we use an LFM waveform, so linear frequency modulated waveform, which is basically a waveform that uh, the frequency increases or decreases with time, uh, uh, so a linear chip. Uh, and that's a known waveform from, for radar um, uh, sensing. As I said, the indices we, we are considering to convey information is the center frequency of the LFM, the bandwidth that the LFM spans, and the polarization that we transmit on. Um, so without going into too much detail in the math, um, on the math and the details of the transmission, 
uh, we're able to show uh, some uh, flexible trade-offs between the radar performance and um, the communication performance. So here, here are the, 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 the size of our constellations. We, we can um, uh, transmit with different, 11 different bandwidths over 20 uh, different uh, center frequencies. And we have three polarization options, um, uh, vertical, horizontal, or both horizontal and vertical. So these, if you do the math, will give you about nine bits per symbol. Uh, and a key parameter here, and, and here's an example of different uh, frequencies being transmitted um, over the air. A key parameter here is the pulse duration of the radar. So different pulse durations and different uh, pulse repetition frequencies obviously will allow many uh, more transmit transmissions of these bits of these symbols per uh, 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 in time, right? So the, the smaller pulse duration, the higher the pulse repetition frequency, the more the data rate. Uh, however, the, the smaller the, the, the pulse duration, the less integration gain you have for your uh, radar um, uh, processing. And here's a direct trade-off. So first we plot here the, the, the received radar SNR with uh, increasing uh, pulse duration of the radar. And over here, this um, graph over here shows us the uh, achievable throughput. So this, the, the throughput we achieved in this over the air transmission. And we compare here uh, a radar only case. So the green line is a radar only case where we don't have any communications, no information is being modulated on the LFM waveform compared to uh, the case where we actually modulate information. So the green one is our benchmark. The blue one is the DFRC waveform. And we show the, as I said, the radar signal SNR and the throughput. And as you can see, as we increase the, um, the pulse duration, we have an increase in the radar SNR, so a better radar performance with a trade-off of a reduced um, uh, uh, throughput in our communication. And through the radar SNR, you, we can also calculate the uh, Kramer L lower bound. So essentially the, the bound on the error estimate on our range. And here you have a direct trade-off between the CRLB, uh, CRLB and throughput, again, as we increase the, the pulse duration. Uh, obviously a high CRLB is bad for radar. So good radar performance is at this end of the spectrum. Good communication performance is at this end uh, of this graph. And again, you can see an explicit trade-off uh, which is tunable based on uh, this parameter uh, for the example we have in, in the lab. Uh, one thing you can observe probably is the throughput is here measured in kilobits per second, so it's rather limited, uh, and that's a limitation, one of the known limitations of the radar-centric approaches. So we've, did, we've done some extensions of this uh, uh, setup to try to incorporate more bits uh, per symbol, and also a higher throughput by further reducing the, the, uh, the pulse duration. So with a different set of parameters, achieving 10 bits per symbols, we, we wanted to see how the throughput would change. So here's the throughput with the communication SNR as we reduce um, the, the, the pulse uh, interval. And this is how then we can achieve uh, some, let's say decent megabits per second uh, rate. And again, this new trade-off where here we show directly the, the maximum throughput, so the communication metric against the radar SNR, so the radar metric, uh, and also the CRLB for uh, the radar range. And again, you can see a flexible throughput as we increase, sorry, a flexible trade-off. As we increase the communication throughput, we have losses in the SNR. As we increase uh, the communication throughput, we have a higher uh, estimation error, right? In, in this elementary example. There's a few things you can do to improve the trade-off. So make the trade-off more benign, sacrifice less radar performance for better throughput, such as integrating uh, multiple radar pulses. This is, just, this is something we didn't do, or simply you know, uh, increasing the, the power, the transmit power of the radar uh, system. Uh, but I think this is plenty of research uh, uh, that could be done in this radar-centric uh, approach. Now, as I said, one thing the radar-centric approach has is this limitation. Inevitably, you'll be limited in terms of the communication rate that you can achieve because the radar waveform is not tuned, is not designed to uh, convey information. So uh, weighted optimizations is, is one way of doing joint DFRC signaling, which has basically gives you, as I said, the flexibility to go from full radar performance to full communication performance. You can flexibly use the resources, time, frequency, power, and so on, 
and you can move on from high data rates to high rate reliability uh, and all the way in between and also accommodate these new waveforms and new signaling to become hardware informed and hardware friendly so friendly to lower specification uh, hardware implementation and we'll see some examples uh, in a minute sorry about this uh, so here's an example weighted optimization so here we have the scenario again uh, a radar based uh, a dual functional base station dfrc base station trying to talk to a number of users while detecting a target and the communication uh, model is uh, this guy over here so the receive sac uh, the receive signal the communication channel the transmit signal that's what we want to design plus noise so anything that lives in h times x aside the, of the information signaling can be considered as multi-user interference, so interference uh, between these transmissions. And that's the metric that we use for communications. And using that, we can have this weighted uh, trade-off uh, design where essentially we minimize the interference power. So this, the, the power of this guy right here, a weighted sum of that with the, uh, the distance of our transmit signal to a known radar waveform. So once we have a radar waveform uh, once we design a radar waveform that's good, that gives us a certain radar performance. We want to design a waveform that's close enough to the radar-only waveform, but also minimizes the communication uh, interference. Uh, and uh, for example, here we have a power budget, so a constraint on the transmit power of this uh, signal. You can have many different variations of this. Another variation is with uh, per antenna power constraints. You can have constant modulus constraints or any other uh, uh, constraints that, uh, that you want and make this hardware friendly and hardware informed. You can see this is a weighted optimization and the key parameter here is rho. So for a high power of rho, this guy becomes significant. If you imagine rho equals, so rho goes from zero to one. So if rho is one, this guy goes away. So you have a communication only optimization. If rho is zero, this guy goes away and you have a radar only optimization. For row between zero and one, you have a weighted uh, optimization, which gives different priority to comms and radar. Some representative results. So on the communication performance, uh, so this is theoretical algorithmic work. So measuring the symbol error rate with transmit SNR. Uh, our benchmark here is a communication only system without interference. And this is what you achieve in terms of symbol error rate. A number of benchmarks, uh, so some closed form uh, techniques for DFRC that can achieve zero interference and uh, a, a good radar waveform. And this is what you achieve with the weighted optimization. So well within one or two dB from the ideal uh, communication only performance. So the communication only, so the communication performance of the DFRC, this weighted uh, um, optimization waveform is within one or two dB of the communication only performance. And, and this is the beam pattern. Uh, for the radar operation. So we have two cases, one an omnidirectional uh, waveform, which we typically use for detection. Uh, and the blue line is the ideal radar waveform. The, the green and yellow lines are for the cases of this weighted optimization for different uh, power constraints. Um, and then the red line is a directional waveform, which you typically use to detect, sorry, to track targets. So here we assume three targets, in these different uh, angles. Uh, and the blue line here is what you can achieve uh, with this weighted optimization. I should mention that we have rho equals 0 0.2, so uh, um, uh, basically a priority towards the radar operation. Uh, and also worth noting that even though our priority is towards radar, uh, we achieve this close match to our, a communication only um, uh, performance. So the explicit trade off in these two scenarios so one for target detection with the omnidirectional design. Here you have the probability of detection a classical radar metric versus the achievable rate for the communication system, bits per hertz per user, uh, the, the units over here. And the blue line shows the case for uh, eight users. We have 16 antennas in this uh, uh, setup. And you can see that this uh, full-fledged trade-off where from the radar only performance, so with uh, rho equals uh, zero, all the way to the communication only performance, uh, sorry, the communication priority performance. Uh, one thing to note uh, is that even for the full radar performance, you have a non-zero communication rate, bits per hertz per user. For the communication uh, priority performance, you have uh, some sort of uh, radar detection, some biased radar detection. So it's not a random uh, detection, right? 
Uh, so one point is this, and the second point, as I said, where before you had either radar only or communication only performance, now you have a flexible trade-off uh, between the two systems. And this trade-off becomes more benign as you uh, increase your degrees of freedom or uh, equivalently reduce the number of users for a fixed number of antennas or increase number of antennas for a fixed number of users. You'll see this trade-off become more benign where you sacrifice, let's say, more, uh, less radar performance to achieve a good uh, communication uh, rate. A similar trade-off for the directional design, angle tracking. Now our performance metric is estimation error, so MSC. So larger numbers of estimation error means worse rate of performance. And you can see again, as I increase uh, my uh, data rate, I see also an increase in the estimation error of, uh, of my radar uh, operation. And again, this trade-off becomes better and better as I increase my uh, degrees of freedom. So uh, I hope it's clear uh, here that, you know, we, we now are able through this co-design of the signaling, we're now able to, to achieve a flexible trade-off between communications uh, and sensing. Uh, and also that we are able to achieve, um, even when we prioritize, prioritize one of the two systems, we still have a certain performance for uh, the other system. Uh, and we've recently tried to uh, demonstrate this in our lab, again, to prove to ourselves that this is not just a theory, not a theoretical concept, but we can actually, this works over the air. And here's another setup where we have, this is now our communication lab. We have an antenna array emulating a, a MIMO access point, two communication users emulated by receive antennas. And here we have, uh, let's say, an, an apparatus where we are trying to measure a, a, a beam pattern. So our aim here is to, to communicate to these two users while also forming a beam towards a direction where, where we assume uh, there's a target that we want to detect. And we're able to see in the lab uh, communication constellations and uh, the theoretical beam pattern and also measure that beam pattern through, through this uh, antenna over here. And as you can see for high um, uh, uh, weighting factors, you have comms priorities, so you have very nice clean uh, constellation but very little on the beam pattern. As you go towards radar only, you have a clear uh, radar beam pattern, which is something like 6 dB, which is the best, uh, I guess, you can achieve with uh, six antennas over here, but a very messy communication um, uh, constellation. Uh, and as I said, we've been able to measure these by moving this uh, around in the lab. We've been able to measure the signal strength at different angles and observe these, the forming of this beam pattern and also uh, measure the bit error rates, so the, the, the communication performance a bit more systematically, where again, we've observed this trade-off that as we increase radar priority, we, have, we suffer in the communication performance. Uh, so this has been a, a weighted uh, optimization case where uh, this is what we call the, the radar-centric weighted optimization, where our aim was uh, to optimize a communication metric while at the same time approximating a good radar waveform. You can do better than that by actually taking into account a bottom line radar metric. So not just trying to approximate a radar waveform, but actually optimize the bottom line uh, radar metric that you want to, you're interested in. And here's a simple optimization, a, a, a more recent example from this paper, where essentially we, met, we minimize the radar uh, Kramer outbound directly instead of the proximity to some uh, radar waveform subject to communication SNR and power constraints. Again, you can, you, you can uh, adjust this trade-off by tuning, let's say this communication parameter, the requirement of the SNR. You have a flexible trade-off on the communication performance versus uh, the radar performance. And this is what you achieve in terms of the beam pattern. Uh, again, without going into too much detail, you'll see that uh, you closely approximate uh, uh, the theoretical uh, beam pattern, but the bottom line performance here is the CRB, right? How well I estimate my radar parameter. And here we have the CRB of the angle with increasing SNR. And these two guys over here uh, relate to the beam pattern approximation design. So the one that I showed earlier, and this is what you can achieve. The yellow line is what you can achieve when you directly uh, optimize for, the, for, the, for your bottom line uh, performance metric for do, two different setups. With uh, So again, here we have 16 antennas. In this more interesting case, we have a closely symmetric uh, channel where we have uh, uh, 14 uh, communication users and one target. 
so close to symmetrical, let's say, channel where we uh, use all our degrees of freedom. And in this case, you can see uh, by, uh, instead of approximating away from, by uh, optimizing uh, the bottom line metric directly, you can achieve something like three to four dB gain in the SNR uh, from the benchmark performance, right? Uh, where you optimize, um, you uh, minimize proximity to a good radar waveform. Uh, now, another um, opportunity you have once you start, uh, um, you know, um, designing the way from, th from the start is to take into account um, uh, hardware perfections and making this hardware uh, efficient. And here's an example where we tried uh, to incorporate um, uh, hardware elements in the design and reduce the hardware from footprint. So uh, it's probably clear by now that on one hand, you want to increase your degrees of freedom. So increase, let's say, the number of antennas uh, for this dual functional base station to be able to accommodate many users and forming good beams towards uh, uh, potential targets. While at the same time, you want to constrain your, your hardware, your power consumption, your hardware complexity, and so on. So a natural approach borrowed by from the communication only literature is to employ a hybrid analog digital uh, precoding. And, and here's a, a, a you know, an architecture here where you have a larger dimension analog processing, smaller dimension uh, baseband processing. Uh, and um, uh, to, to save a bit of time, I'll go directly to the design. So FRF relates to the RF part, uh, so the, the analog part. FBB relates to the baseband part. And here we optimize these two uh, precoders uh, in a weighted optimization where on one hand we had we have the um, uh, approximation of a good communication only waveform. On the other side, we have a good radar only waveform. And we have our usual power constraint and some constraints that relate to the analog um, uh, uh, beamformer, for example, being constant modulus or having finite precision in terms of its angles uh, and so on. Again, I won't go into too much detail because uh, uh, I'll need the time for the rest of the topics, but uh, some indicative results. Here we're able to simulate a scenario with 128 antennas, uh, uh, transmitting only with six RF chains, serving six users, and detecting three targets. And here we have our rate, uh, communication rate with SNR. Our benchmark is this red line, which is the communication only um, uh, precoding fully digital, so 128 RF chains, just for this case. And this is what you can achieve for this hybrid approach, dual functional, dual functional approach, as you increase the weighting factor, we call it eta here. So eta, a high fact weighting factor gives a priority to the communications. And this is the best you can do in terms of hybrid uh, communication precoding. Uh, and here's um, the energy efficiency. So we wanted to, to measure how well we're doing in terms of essentially the hardware footprint. The energy efficiency is defined as the communication rate over the power consumption which obviously is a function of the precoders we design and also the number of RF chains, the RF chain consumption and so on. And once you now uh, uh, take energy efficiency as your metric, this uh, uh, trade-off is, is flipped. So you have uh, these hybrid techniques having a much better power efficiency compared to uh, the, the fully digital uh, approach, communication only approach, right? So here we're able to provide both functionalities and with a better efficiency than a fully digital communication approach. And this is how our beam pattern looks like. So three targets. This is the ideal radar beam pattern. And uh, the observation here is you have these increasing side lobes once you start relaxing the, the radar constraints. So once you start increasing the communication priority, you're still able to point to the three directions you want, but with increased uh, side lobes, which will inevitably affect the, the radar performance. So moving on uh, quite fast, uh, I'd like to highlight um, this uh, unique, as I said, security uh, issues that relate to DFRC. So the fact now that you have a radar probing waveform that at the same time carries information to communication users makes, this, um, uh, makes it possible for a radar target uh, to eavesdrop. And the radar target can be a friendly node, but it also can be a non-cooperative node, let's say a non-cooperative car in a vehicular communication scenario, or in a military scenario, an enemy aircraft or a malicious UAV. And now you're giving the opportunity by encoding information in the radar probing away from for that target to eavesdrop. 
And that's a unique thing uh, uh, you know, for this DFRC uh, technology. Uh, thankfully, there's a lot of uh, technologies that you can borrow uh, from physical layer security for communications only, uh, such as secure beam forming, artificial noise, and so on. Uh, one thing I forgot to say is that even if you encrypt the information on higher layer, the, the transmission itself, the, the fact that you're transmitting, can be useful information to the radar target. And that's why you need physical layer uh, uh, security approaches here. Uh, so an interesting trade-off that you have in this scenario uh, relates to the radar link. So on one hand side, you want to be able to point energy towards the radar, towards the target. So you want to illuminate the target, so point signal energy towards the direction of the target. But at the same time and at the same direction, you want to limit the useful signal uh, power uh, that goes towards the target. So on one hand side, you want to maximize your uh, radar SNR, so point a lot of power towards the target so that your echo uh, has uh, you know, significant uh, radar capability, significant radar SNR, while at the same time limiting the eavesdropping SNR of the target. And that is typically subject to quality constraints, quality of service constraints for the communication users, such as the SNR of these legitimate uh, users. So this, this link over here gives you a, a unique and challenging uh, scenario with some uh, uh, clashing, clashing, let's say, uh, objectives. Uh, on the other hand side, the sensing capability of radar gives you uh, unique opportunities also in providing uh, communication security. So uh, classical physical layer security approaches benefit from knowing something about the eavesdropper, either you know, spanning from the direction of the eavesdropper or the channel of the eavesdropper or the SNR achieved by the eavesdropper. And these are typically difficult to get. And here the radar functionality, the sensing functionality, uh, gives you an opportunity to actually extract that information, uh, at least in terms of directions of eavesdroppers or link quality of eavesdroppers uh, and so on, or path loss uh, towards the, the direction of the eavesdropper and so on. So it gives you here also an opportunity to inform these uh, physical layer security approaches, such as secure beam forming, where you want to uh, uh, steer the nose or jamming and so on. And here's an example scenario. Again, I'll, I'll try to avoid uh, the math uh, just to save a bit of time. We've taken, so here's the same scenario, uh, dual functional base station communicating to users, detecting a target while uh, providing secrecy against uh, the target eavesdropping. We've taken an artificial noise approach where the transmit signal is this guy over here, X, what we want to optimize. And it has a structure of the information signal pre-coded by matrix W, and we have this artificial noise over here. Then the covariance of X, which is important for designing the, the radar beam pattern, is given by uh, the sum of the covariance of the pre-coding and the noise. And then you can formulate the SNR of your communication users uh, as a function of this uh, W, uh, essentially my transmit signal. You can formulate the SNR achieved at the eavesdropper, uh, again, a function of the precoder and the artificial noise. And we use the worst case secrecy rate here. So the worst, let's say, uh, difference between the communication rate to these users minus the eavesdropping rate uh, of the target. Uh, Perhaps I won't go into too much detail here, but the example optimization is where we, we minimize uh, uh, the radar eavesdropping SNR. So I'm getting a bit of noise if, if I can ask you to mute. Uh, so we minimize the radar as, uh, the eavesdropping SNR subject to uh, a PSLR of the radar beam pattern. So having a good radar beam pattern that points to the direction of the target with low side lobes. And this is the constraint over here. And uh, uh, assuming some sort of uncertainty at the target location, we want uh, the main beam of our radar uh, beam to be wide enough so that it captures the uncertainty interval. So we don't know exactly where the target is, but we know it's, it should be uh, within this interval. So to make the, the, the transmission robust, uh, we employ these uh, uh, main beam uh, region over here. Obviously, once you have this uncertainty, it means you have a wider beam, and it means uh, that you need to guarantee security throughout all that beam, right? So that the, your security constraints become more uh, demanding. Uh, and here we, we also have the SNR constraints for the, for the users, power budget, and some classical uh, constraints relating to the covariance of the precoder. 
And this can be solved by known techniques, fractional programming to deal with this guy and uh, semi-definite uh, relaxation. Some, uh, again, indicative results. So here's how the radar beam pattern looks like. So the dashed line relates to when we know exactly the, the, the direction of the, the target, and we just need to track the target from a narrow beam towards the direction. And here's what you have once you have uncertainty. So you need to widen the, the beam. Uh, so you're able to track a, a range of uh, angles over here. And that will in turn uh, give you a, a, a lower uh, peak to side lobe ratio. And here's the, the, the direct trade-off between the secrecy rate this time and the, the, the radar performance uh, measured as peak to side lobe ratio. A, a number of lines here, I won't go into the detail, but the main picture is that you can go all the way from uh, communication uh, secrecy priority to the radar uh, um, uh, beam pattern priority and all the way in between, just like we, show, uh, we saw in our previous uh, examples. So going one step ahead in further improving uh, security here, we wanted to uh, explore the, the concept of constructive and destructive interference. And that's a technique that we've been working in my team for the, for the past decade or so. Uh, and constructive interference means any interference that pushes your uh, received signal away from decision threshold of the constellation. So here's an example of BPSK. This is the decision threshold. Constructive is any interference, so the green shaded area here that pushes your signal away from the decision threshold. Destructive is anything that pushes it towards the decision threshold. So that has an impact on how well uh, essentially you can uh, decode information, essentially what uh, uh, tolerance to noise you have, so essentially what SNR you can achieve. Uh, as I said, there's many uh, works in the area that have shown significant gains in terms of energy efficiency, uh, orders of magnitude gains compared to classical uh, pre-coding that I don't have the time to go through here. But the one thing that's important is, is the mathematical formulation that comes from the geometry. So if this is a, a PSK constellation, this is an example of QPSK. Constructive region is this green shaded area where the distance from the decision thresholds uh, is increased. And you can come up with explicit mathematical uh, uh, constraints for constructive interference by first phase shifting the general uh, constellation point so that it's on the real axis. And by looking at the trigonometry here, the geometry, you can come up with this kind of constraint. And here you have the imaginary part of this phase rotated received signal, the real part of this signal, the angle over here that relates to the order of the uh, uh, constellation. And gamma here is an SNR parameter uh, that basically tells you gamma is over here. So if I increase gamma, I have further distance from the uh, uh, decision thresholds, so that essentially translates to a higher SNR. Lower gamma translates to lower SNRs. So this, uh, we, you can employ uh, classical approaches, replace SNR constraints with this kind of uh, uh, constraints, and now you have constructive interference pre-coding. And here's an example where we employ this in, in this uh, secrecy DFRC scenario, again, the same scenario. And here we want to use constructive interference to benefit the signals of the legitimate users and destructive interference to harm the eavesdropping capability of the target. So looking again at the same constellation, we want the legitimate user signals to lie in the green area, the constructive area of the constellation. We want the, the, um, the uh, uh, received signal of the target to lie in the destructive area. So anywhere outside the green shaded area. Again, an optimization based approach where we um, uh, maximize the minimum radar SNR, so to optimize radar performance, while at the same time, uh, um, here's a, uh, the power budget, and at the same time, we're satisfying uh, some communication SNR threshold, so gamma here is the SNR, with constructive interference, so this will take care of this green shaded area, and at the same time, we have destructive interference for uh, the radar uh, eavesdropping, so that will uh, make sure your signal falls inside these um, uh, orange areas, let's say. So exploiting the concept of constructive and destructive interference. Uh, and this is what the constellations look like. So we, first we have the approach where we also ex only exploit constructive interference. Uh, uh, here we have a QPSK constellation and an APSK. So this is what the users receive. So their user receives the blue uh, dossier, assuming that we have transmitted one plus J, for example, here. And the radar receives anything along 
uh, let's say the, uh, a unit circle here. We normalize the, the receive signal power uh, for the uh, radar eavesdropper, the target eavesdropper. Uh, and this is what happens again with uh, 8PSK. So uh, the constructive interference is now in this uh, more constrained region. And this is what you can achieve by exploiting both constructive and destructive. And the difference here is that the, the target receives signal never goes in the area of the actual transmitted signal uh, constellation, right? So you have a better secrecy performance. And two indicative results, the radar beam pattern, again, depending on uh, the degrees of freedom, we are able to approximate a good radar beam pattern and provide a good radar performance, while at the same time, providing good secrecy. So this is a simple error rate for the communication users, different designs, and for the radar eavesdropping uh, uh, capability. And here you can see a, a simple error rate of 0 0.75 for the target. So for QPSK means basically random guessing uh, of, the, of the constellation point. Uh, a final thing, I hope I have five more minutes to, to discuss about a, a use case of DFRC. I wanna discuss about a scenario where uh, the communication is served from sensing. So a sensing assisted communication scenario. And, and here's an example that relates to vehicle communications. So typically in establishing and maintaining a, a, a communication link, we have uh, the, the base station needs to uh, form beams and track with its beams the, the movement of the communication user. And typically this involves a feedback loop an iterative process where the, the base station first forms a beam, then the communication user measures the quality of the beam, the quality of the link and feeds back stuff like either the, the signal to noise ratio explicitly uh, or a, a, a preferred beam index. So which of these two, for example, beams, I want my uh, base station to, to uh, transmit. And you can refine further the beams, so make the beams narrower, and that will involve further iterations and so on and so forth. And you have dedicated resources in your uh, frame. So if this is a, a let's say a, a subframe, you have resources for the, this beam training, where you have this iterative process and the feedback and the rest you use for um, data transmission. So the more time you spend uh, forming an array beam, the better uh, summary you can achieve within this data transmission, but the, the higher the overhead you have in establishing the link. So there's a, an interesting trade-off in, in terms of the radar um, uh, beam width. Now, there's particular opportunities here to, to exploit DFRC signaling because you, you can exploit the radar echoes instead of uh, uh, feedback from the user, uh, where essentially you have a DFRC signal that conveys information, downlink information to the vehicular users and exploits the echoes from these vehicles to form beams uh, and make sure it tracks uh, the, you, the communication users as they move along. Uh, and this has critical gains. First of all, you don't need explicit resources for channel estimation. You don't need feedback. Uh, from, the, from the users. That means you avoid stuff like uh, feedback errors or quantization errors that come along with this feedback operation. And that also means the whole downlink frame through DFRC signaling can be used for tracking and beam steering. And that has significant gains in, in the match filtering uh, uh, gain of the radar uh, processing and the, essentially the beam steering. Uh, and here's an example uh, scenario where we have uh, a, a roadside unit, an access point, tracking uh, um, a communication user. So here we exploit uh, the radar echoes to detect angles of interest where we want to point our beam and a simple prediction mechanism, so common filtering to predict where we need to point the next uh, beam. So we use a state transition model that includes uh, all the relevant radar parameters, angle of arrival, uh, distance, velocity, uh, uh, cross-section that relates to path loss and so on. This is the radar measurement model. And by simple uh, match filtering, you can uh, estimate stuff about the, uh, the, the, this car over here, which is your communication users, one of which is the angle that you need to point your beam. And by using a simple prediction uh, mechanism, you can find out what's the next beam you will need to, to point to. Uh, and here we have a fundamental comparison between uh, this dual functional approach. You can do the same prediction with a communications only approach uh, uh, you through feedback and so on. 
uh, which is uh, the other benchmark that we use here. And we have another benchmark, which is uh, again a communication only approach that relies on the communication user selecting between a, a pair of preferred uh, beams and feeding back information to the, to the base station for this beam training. And here we have the, we measure the, the rate as basically, if we assume the base station is at this position and the car moves along uh, the, the direction of the base station. And you can see with the communication only approaches, so this purple line, we have with this beam pair tracking, we have an increasing rate until at some point the, the angle changes so fast that it falls outside these two uh, uh, beams and you can no longer track the communication users, so the, the rate drops significantly. The communication only performance using prediction, you can maintain some uh, uh, performance here, but it suffers by the limited uh, resources that you can dedicate here. So you cannot form uh, uh, you know, very uh, narrow beams. While in the radar approach, you can form narrow beams and your rate keeps increasing as you move closer to the base station. And you obviously maintain a good link with, with the best performance out of the three. Uh, so I hope this made clear, uh, uh, you know, the, the use of, of this uh, sensing assisted uh, approach. And I, I hope uh, from, from our discussion, um, it's, it's already clear that, uh, you know, designing new waveforms uh, for communications and radar, incorporating these two functionalities in a single transmission is spectrally energy and hardware efficient. But beyond that, you can uh, design explicit trade-offs you can design new synergies with sensing assisted communications. And I hope I also managed to highlight uh, some unique security challenges uh, that arise with this scenario. I'd also like to acknowledge uh, the, the projects that have funded uh, part of this research, uh, a national and a European project. Um, and finally, uh, just to leave you um, uh, with this uh, final slide, uh, just to, to, to uh, uh, basically talk about how I see this going forward. So most of the stuff I've been talking about is making uh, uh, you know, a, a dual functional base station uh, serve two operations, uh, communications and sensing. There's plenty of work I think that needs to go into further exploring this new metrics, uh, new uh, uh, approaches, making this hardware efficient, energy efficient and so on. There's plenty more research, I think, in uh, establishing other radar assisted uh, communication scenarios. Even in the vehicular scenarios, there's plenty more to do. In the previous work, we assumed one vehicle, simple trajectory, but what happens when you have many vehicles to track, complex trajectories, uh, and so on. Uh, uh, there's plenty more, again, to do in terms of security FRC, many physical layer uh, communications only. Uh, approaches that you can explore uh, to provide security for DFRC. Many opportunities in, again, exploiting the radar functionality to assist with the communication security. Uh, and moving towards this, let's say, uh, joint infrastructure, where you have the cellular infrastructure not only doing communications, but doing this dual functionality, uh, one needs to also consider multi-cell and, and multi-transmitter uh, topologies where you need to consider interference between different DFRC cells, um, <clears throat> multi-user uh, communications, multi-cell communications, multi-static sensing, uh, and so on and so forth. So plenty of open research uh, in the area. I think I'll stop here. Uh, in, in the slides, I include some, uh, some of the references of, of some works from, from our team in, uh, in terms of overviews, coexistence scenarios, dual functional, uh, hardware efficient scenarios, uh, security, vehicular applications, and the recent uh, one on uh, the experimental uh, uh, work. And with that, I'll, I think I'll close here, and I'd be happy to take any questions if we have time. Okay, thank you very much, Christos, for the uh, wonderful talk. And uh, I think uh, we have time for uh, two quick questions. So there's a question asked by Lu Wang. So uh, Dr. Wang, can you please uh, unmute yourself and uh, ask the question? Oh, okay, thank you. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, we can yep. hear you. Yeah, yeah. Uh, thank you, Professor. And I want, uh, since I'm a beginner, so I'm also uh, sure about my question, but I still want to ask you, uh, the first one is, uh, in your work, uh, 
hardware efficient drug radio and communication, there is a work about hardware efficient. In this work, I saw your formulation is a trade-off between communication and sensing. Uh, here, I'm not so clear about why it is hardware efficient. Can you give a mm -hmm. uh, explanation about the hardware efficient here? So, uh, you know, the quick response is uh, that in that formulation, we split our processing into the analog and digital domain. Uh, perhaps yeah. I went a bit quickly through this. So splitting this uh, allows you to uh, uh, exploit a large number of antennas mm -hmm. while using only a limited number of RF chains. And this is a classical technique. Hybrid pre-coding is a classical technique that's used in the communication only literature. So you have a high dimensional analog processing typically implemented by phase shifters and so on. Uh, and only a few uh, actual RF chains that implement your baseband uh, processing. So in this, this bit of work, we borrowed this uh, architecture from the communication only literature uh, to reduce essentially the number of RF chains that you need to use for a DFRC transmission. Okay, okay, thank you. And my second question is um, because you have uh, introduced a lot of work and in different works, you use different metrics for radar sensing. So can you give a brief like conclusion about them and which, like which uh, metric is suitable for which kind of mm -hmm. scenario or which kind of problem? So there's like there's plenty of communication metrics, there's plenty radar metrics that relate to different uh, operations of sensing and radar. Uh, so like communications, you have some rates, SNR, symbol error rate, and so on. Uh, similarly, in the, in the radar literature, you have many of these metrics depending on the, the operation of the radar. So when you're uh, detecting a target, you have probability of detection, false alarm, and so on. Uh, when you're estimating a target, you have the mean square error, the estimation error, uh, Kramer Rao, lower bound, and many others. There's many in the literature. Uh, what I hope I conveyed, the, you know, the, the main idea I wanted to convey is that you can actually, instead of trying to approximate waveforms, uh, once you employ the bottom line metrics, you have the opportunity to optimize uh, the bottom line performance uh, much better than when you're trying to approximate a good radar waveform. Uh, but you know, to answer your question, there's there's plenty of metrics that you can use from the literature. Okay, okay, uh, thank you very much. No problem. Okay, so I think uh, we have uh, uh, we have time for a very uh, quick question. So this is a question from uh, Yi Ming Huo, and uh, so he's asking about uh, the spectrum. Uh, so uh, Yi Ming, can you please? Uh, uh, unmute yourself. All right. So can can you and everybody hear me? So yeah, yeah, I'm Amy, yeah, yeah. and yeah. I'm so I feel so honored to attend this very inspiring webinar. So my question is related to the spectrum. So uh, people talking about like uh, sub terahertz terahertz, um, very pros uh, promising to be used for the future, 6G or beyond communications. So. When doing the sensing stuff, I mean, particularly for the radar communications, possibly you will, you will have very, very um, um, strong dependency on the environment, um, either indoor and outdoor. So could Professor comment on the uh, minimum wave and uh, terahertz um, frequency bands to be to be used for the radar communication, and also possibly yeah. related to some like, um, you know, the radar propagation channels, since, you know, uh, usually um, you would have really um, um, const uh, tough constraint on the SNR when, when using the radar since it's uh, uh, going in backwards, right? So sometimes you even don't have any, you know, return feedback from the radar mm -hmm. communication. So thank you very much. Okay, thank you for that question. Uh, I mean, none of my work really assumed a, a certain, uh, let's say, frequency band. It's all kind of baseband uh, you know, development. The comment I, I can make about the move to higher frequencies and terahertz, uh, I mean, obviously you have gains in the communication performance with larger bandwidths, you can push more data. Uh, also, you, you can get uh, performance gains in the sensing. 
uh, because you, you can achieve better resilience um, in uh, better resolution in, uh, for example, uh, range detection with higher bandwidths. As you said, a challenge is path loss. So all these will be much related to the application you want to use. So millimeter wave radars are already used in cars for park assist. So short range, let's say, uh, detection. And with, you know, like for communications with the advanced signal processing, you can probably uh, extend these applications to a, a number of other scenarios. Uh, but definitely uh, a lot of uh, uh, open problems, a lot to do in this uh, area. All right, thank you very much. Professor. Okay, so I think uh, there'll be enough for questions. And uh, let's uh, thank Chrisos again for your wonderful presentation. And uh, if anyone has any uh, further questions, uh, please you can contact uh, uh, Chrysos directly uh, using the email, or you can contact me because uh, lots of works are, have been done by me, actually. OK, Absolutely. so thanks again, Chrysos. I think uh, we can move forward to our next speaker. Uh, OK, so let me uh, share the screen again. Okay, so um, we are very honored uh, to have our second speaker, Professor Wu Yu, in, our, in this uh, uh, ISAC webinar series. And uh, Professor Yu is now a full professor at the uh, University of Toronto, Canada. And we all know that uh, he has made a great contribution and has very strong leadership in information theory and the wireless communication. So Professor Yu was the uh, president of the HVE Information Theory Society in 2021 and has served on BOG since uh, 2015. And uh, he was an HVE Comsoc distinguished lecturer. He has served as a uh, every editor, associate editor and editor for several HVE transactions and journals. And uh, he was also on the uh, technical program committee in uh, for several HVE conferences like ISIT, ICC, and Globcom. So Professor Wee has received uh, numerous uh, awards, including uh, the uh, pre prestigious HVE Communications Society Award, uh, Marconi Prize, and the several best of paper awards from the uh, HVE SPS. So as far uh, as what I know, um, Professor Yu has recently uh, won another two S SPS awards. So in uh, 2021. And uh, uh, of course, Professor Yu is a fellow of the HBE and a fellow of the Canadian Ac Academy of Engineering. So Professor Yu, we are looking forward to your presentation on uh, active uh, sensing for communication by learning. So Professor Yu, please, can you uh, share your screen? Okay, thank you for the kind introduction. So let me share my screen. So the title of my talk is Active Sensing for Communications by Learning. So this is joint work with my uh, former and current students and postdocs, uh, Fua Sharabi, Julian Chen, Tao Jiang, and uh, uh, Wei Chui. We're from the University of Toronto. So I'm glad to be part of this integrated sensing and communications workshop uh, uh, seminar series. So let's go back to see why do we want to integrate sensing and communications. I believe the strongest motivation is the integrated spectra. Millimeter wave communications, so terahertz, used to be used for sensing applications, but now this part of 5G uh, wireless standards and uh, likely to be part of 6G as well. So as a result, we have integrated transceiver hardware. We have hardware both capable of doing sensing and communications, and they can potentially share the same waveform. And most importantly, we have applications that demand both sensing and communication capabilities at the same time. So this is why we want to integrate sensing and communication capabilities in future uh, system design. But if you look at the most classical communication system today, I argue that they already have both sensing and communication capabilities. So for example, um, we, we do sensing in terms of we do channel estimation before any data, data transmission can, can, uh, can occur. And further, if you look at the classical communication system design, we always embrace kind of sort of separation principle. 
So for example, uh, we have a separation of source coding and channel coding. Now, of course, you can do joint source channel coding, uh, source and channel coding, but vast majority of particle systems actually separate source channel, source coding, data compression, and channel coding, uh, that is uh, uh, data transmission. Now, if you focus on the channel coding part of the system design, uh, we, we almost always separate the channel estimation part from the data transmission part. Now, of course, you can do blind channel estimation, but most systems uh, dis decide to uh, uh, embrace a, a, a separation principle. And if you look at the data transmission uh, component, we almost always separate coding and modulation. Right? So these separation principles make sense from an engineering perspective, and they're often also uh, supported by information theoretical uh, principles. So in this talk, I'm not going to talk about uh, joint sensing and communications, uh, so, so to speak, but rather we're going to just focus on sensing and to talk about sensing for communications. And a particular focus of this talk is to look at the role of machine learning in optimizing sensing strategies. It turns out if you just focus on sensing problems, it's already a very interesting problem with uh, where uh, we can see the, the, the role of machine learning for future design of, of, of sensing, uh, sensing systems. So this is what this talk is, is going to be about. So let's start with a motivating example. So let's consider a massive MIMO millimeter wave system. So here we have a, we have a base station equipped with many antennas, and they're serving many users at the same time in the, in the same frequency. So this massive uh, MIMO millimeter wave system is important for enhanced mobile broadband, and this is a, a sort of a standard setup for 5G systems. Now, in order to transmit at, at a high throughput, we need to estimate the channel. But most massive MIMO systems today are not designed as a fully digital beamforming system, meaning that they don't have a full, uh, a full blown RF chain for each antenna. But rather, they do this hybrid beamforming strategy where you design an analog beamformer, then you sample the channel in, a low, in some low dimensional space. So this is called analog beamforming. And uh, this is called hybrid beamforming. So one of the uh, key challenges for designing millimeter system is how do we estimate the channel? How do we estimate this high dimensional channel with only low dimensional observations? Okay, so how, if we have a limited number of IF chains, how do we uh, uh, find the channel direction? And this is called initial beam alignment problem for a millimeter, millimeter wave system. So let's set up this problem and look at the very simple uh, example of, a, of, a, of a such a system. We have a single user equipment, single user transmitting uh, a pilot signal for the base station, and base station has the task of designing uh, uh, designing the beamformer for that user. So to do that, he has to estimate the channel. Okay, so let's assume that we have a very simple channel model, where the channel consists of a single path with a, with the uh, with the angle of arrival theta, and a fading coefficient alpha. Now the challenging part is that although the base station has multiple antennas it doesn't have a, a separate RF chain for each antenna, rather it has a single RF chain. So it has to look at the channel through a particular direction. And this direction is the beamforming direction WT here. So the question is, how should we design this WT in order to estimate the channel? And further, we can potentially design this WT in, 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 in several stages. Okay, so because of this RF, uh, chain limitation, the base station must sense the channel through this analog beamformer. So we're going to design this analog beamformer in, a, in an intelligent fashion. And further, we can do this in multiple stages. And we can see, you see that this initial alignment problem is really a sequential decision problem in the sense that at any given time, so you consider this, 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 this channel sensing stage, a sensing process happening in multiple stages. And each stage, what you want to do is to look at where the channel is in a particular direction, then based on the received observation, you can design the direction where, where you should look in the next stage uh, according to the previous observations. And you can do this over multiple stages. And at the end, after you have done this over the tall stages, then you can find the angle of arrival for this uh, channel um, uh, uh, and, and, and find this uh, the estimated uh, angle of arrival. You see that even for this single, single problem, this optimization process of how do you optimize where to look is actually a fairly complex uh, uh, mathematical optimization problem. And this is really a high dimensional sequential decision problem in the sense that we want to sequentially design these observations in the most efficient fashion so that after these finite number of stages, we can, we can figure out where the angle arrival is. 
So let's focus on this sequential decision problem and to see how do we design this sensing strategies in the most efficient fashion. So this sequential design of sensing strategy makes sense. In the, in, 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 uh, make, make sense. So let, let, let me give you an example of, of, of such a system why, uh, to, to motivate why we're going to do this uh, uh, sequentially. Suppose we know that the, the angle of arrival is between 30 to 60 degrees. So what we can do is we can, uh, we can use a bisection approach. Okay, we can bisection, with, we, we can design two analog beamformers, one uh, from 30 to 45 degrees, the other from 45 to 60, de 60 degrees, and to, to, to see where the angle is between these two, two, two intervals. So when, once we figure out where the angle is, then we can further bisect the, uh, the, the angle, and then we can do this sequentially to, to, to eventually find out where the angle arrival is. So this is a sequence of beamformers we can design, and these are called hierarchical beamforming uh, codebooks. This is designed in this well-known paper. And this allows us to essentially find the, 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 the angle um, using sort of log n number of stages. So let's ask the question of whether this sequential uh, design using hierarchical approach is optimal. Right? So it turns out that uh, this sequential design, you can improve this hierarchical uh, design considerably. But before describing our approach, let's just formulate the problem. So what we want to do is to design the next sensing stage, next sensing vector in, in, in an intelligent fashion. But we're going to design this next sensing stage based on previous observations. But the pre this previous observation sort of grows as the number of sensing stages, uh, 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 number of sensing stages increase. So what we want is to, we want something to capture what the observation is so far. So it turns out that if you want to just estimate the angle arrival, then a sufficient statistics for, 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 for estimating this angle arrival is actually the posterior distribution of this angle. So what we're really trying to do for this, in this problem is to map this posterior, posterior distribution into the next sensing vector. Okay. So now after the tall stages, after many stages, then you can finally find the uh, uh, estimated, the, the, uh, you can estimate the angle based on the final posterior. So our problem really is the following. We want to uh, find the best estimate of the angle arrival. We want to minimize the MSC of the angle over these two mapping functions. One is to map the posterior of, of the angle so far to the next sensing vector. And the other mapping is to map the final a posterior distribution to the estimated angle. Okay. Now you see that these mapping functions actually are, are, are high, dimen high dimensional mappings. So if you want to solve this problem directly, it's actually quite a challenging problem. So this part of this talk, part of the message of this talk is that uh, if you use a hierarchical beamforming, if you restrict these beamformers to be in one of these codebooks, one of the beamform vectors in the pro codebooks, this is actually not the optimal design. A much better design is to use a codebook free adaptive beamforming to remove the constraint that the beamformer has to be in the codebook and use a deep learning approach to intelligent to intelligent design these sensing vectors. Okay, to convince you that the codebook free approach is better, uh, let's first look at the uh, a motivating example. So let's assume just a single stage designing beamformer in one stage. And for simplicity, let's assume that the uh, um, the channel fading coefficient is known. So we ask the question, given a prior distribution of the angle or angle arrival, how do we design the sensing vector to, to minimize the angle arrival minimum, uh, minimum square, uh, um, mean square arrow in the next stage? Now this problem, if you restrict yourself to a single stage can actually be written down mathematically. So what you can do is you can write down what the posterior distribution of the angle is given the observation given a one single observation. And this can be written down mathematically like this. Then you can find the best MSC estimation as the expected value of the theta, expected value of the phi given the observations. Okay, so this can all be written down. So then you can write down what the uh, mean square error is. Mean square error is that this, this is my estimated angle minus the true angle, take a square, then integrate over the, 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 the posterior distribution. So the point is that if you just look at the single stage, this is actually a mathematical optimization problem. We can, we can explicitly write down. And where the optimizing variable is which direction to look. So this is the W, w tau here. 
you see that this W tau enters this objective function through multiple integrals. There's an integral here, integral here, and there are two integrals here. So this whole objective function is quite complex to, to just to evaluate. But nevertheless, this is a problem that you can write down. Okay, so how do we go about solving this problem? So let's just take a simple approach and to do a coordinate descent. Okay, so we want to solve this mathematical optimization problem. We can just coordinate descent to find what the optimum WT is. So here's an example. So suppose our posterior distribution is this between 30 to 60 degrees. If you use coordinate descent, you, 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 you will find that the optimal sensing uh, uh, vector, sensing filter, uh, will, will look, like, uh, look like this is the blue curve here. Okay, so it's not intuitive why, why should it look at this direction, but this turned out to be the best direction. But the problem of the using coordinate descent is that it's actually a, a mathematically very complicated. In fact, if you integrate, if you, if, you, if you try to evaluate this objective function and to do this coordinate descent, it takes several days to, 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 to derive um, um, this sensing vector in, in, in uh, our, uh, our computer. Okay, so this is, this is a highly complex mathematical problem to solve. Now, if you use a code book based approach, the complexity, computation complexity can be significantly improved. That is, instead of designing an, uh, over an arbitrary WT, you restrict yourself to these sort of bisection WTs. Okay, so you, you take WT to be one of these sensing vectors, one of these beamforming vectors in this code book. Now, so if you do that, the computational complexity can be significantly improved. On the other hand, the achieved mean square error is much worse. In fact, it's, it's much, much worse. It's like 18 dBs worse than the optimal solution. So hierarchical codebook is by no means optimal, but solving this mathematical problems, a problem uh, optimally is computationally complex. So this is where deep learning comes in. So what we're gonna do here is to propose a codebook free beamforming. So we wanna not restrict ourselves to this codebook uh, uh, based design, but we want to improve the complexity of solving this mathematical optimization problem. So what we do is that we take a deep learning approach. We use a DNN, use a deep learning, uh, a deep neural network to map the posterior distribution directly to the optimized solution. Okay. Then we train this deep neural network through many realizations of the, of, of the sample. Okay. So it turns out this can achieve almost the optimal performance of the exhaustive search of the coordinate descent while having the complexity uh, uh, much lower than, 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 than mathematical optimization. It only takes a few minutes to train a DNN to converge to the same as MSC as the coordinate descent. Right, so this is really the uh, motivation for perform uh, deep learning here. And um, here's how we implement this uh, deep learning module. So in this deep learning module, we take the posterior distribution as the input for the, for the, for the DNN and produce the uh, uh, beamformer, the, the observation uh, sensing vector as the output. And we also have the, the power constraint P as the input and also the number of stage, the stage index as the input to the, to the DNN. Okay? And the, the, the DNN is, uh, is, is uh, implemented using a fully, fully connected architecture. So how do we train this DNN? We actually do this uh, over multiple stages. So we concatenate this DNN one after another. Then we train the entire DNN as a very deep neural network, but we tie the weights of this, this, this neural network across the stages. And we use backpropagation to uh, stochastic uh, gradient descent, backpropagation to, to train the uh, parameters of these, 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 this um, uh, 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 deep neural network. Okay, so the optimal goal is to, 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 to recover the AOA, to, so, so the loss function is, is the MSC of the estimated angle. So this approach is, is very effective. Uh, let me show you how well uh, this does. Now, to implement this, we need the posterior distribution as the input to the, to the neural network. So we have to compute this posterior distribution. And this is where the most of complexity lies because uh, computing posterior distribution requires integration. So we have to use uh, uh, a discretization step to, to, to compute, this, uh, uh, compute this posterior distribution. So assume that you have the posterior distribution, then, then you can implement this deep neural network. But there's one more, uh, 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 one more caveat here. We also, we, we not only have to estimate the angle, we also have to uh, estimate the gain of the channel, estimate the fading coefficient. So if the K40 
fitting coefficient is known, then we can directly implement this uh, neural network approach. But if the fitting coefficient is not known, then we have to find some way to keep track of this fitting coefficient. So what we can do is to, we can estimate this um, uh, a fitting coefficient, then feed this big uh, fitting coefficient as part of the computation of the posterior before we feed that posterior to the, to the, to the deep neural network. Okay. And this estimating estimation of the uh, channel coefficients is actually not trivial um, because suppose you use the MMSE estimator of the fitting coefficient. Um, this, this will work pretty well, but the complexity is quite actually uh, quite high because you need to keep track of all the past observations in order to estimate the estimate the coefficient fading coefficient so that the the the, the observation sequence observation um, historical observation actually grow over time another way of estimating uh, fading coefficient is to use a common filter so what we can do is uh, in order to reduce the complexity we can assume that the fading coefficient is, uh, is 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 a, is is a Gaussian random variable with with certain mean and variance. Then we use a common filter to to to, to keep track of its mean and variance. So this also works uh, fairly well, um, um, and it actually works almost as well as the MMSC estimator, but with lower complexity. All right, so let me show you how well uh, this system works. So here is the implementation implementation detail of of this neural network. We use a fully connected architecture with four layers. And let's assume that the angle of arrival come from minus 60 to 60 degrees, and the fading coefficient is a, is a, is a, is a, is a random, um, random vector. We have 128 uh, antennas at the, at the base station. So here are some numerical results. Our baseline are the compressive sensing approach with fixed beamforming. So this is ONP for finding the angle of arrival for the, for the, for the, for the channel. And the two hierarchical beamforming approaches, one uh, in this original paper using a bisection and the other uh, using this posterior matching uh, approach in, 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 uh, in this paper. So the posterior matching works better than hierarchical uh, beamforming approach using, using bisection. So this is the red curve here. So this, this red curve uh, is posterior matching, assuming that the channel coefficient alpha is known. Now, if you assume the channel coefficient alpha is known, our proposed DNN can actually perform much better. So this is this solid curve is the proposed DNN, assuming also known channel. You see that we have a 5 dB uh, gain, almost about 4 or 5 dB gain, uh, in terms of the SNR required to uh, get a target uh, AOA estimation error target. So this solid curve is assuming that the alpha is known. But if the alpha is not known, we have to keep, keep track of the alpha using either MMSC approach or the common filter approach. You see that uh, we have a loss if we don't know the alpha. But even if the alpha is not known, we can do almost as well as the previous state of art, assume, which, which assumes that the alpha is known. So we see that this DNN approach is very effective in terms of solving of this complex optimization problem. So let's step back a little bit and to talk about really the role of machine learning in sensing and communications, or more generally, the role of machine learning optimization uh, uh, in general. So traditional optimization is all about efficient search through an optimization landscape. In fact, the code grill of optimization is transform problem into a convex form. But there's really no universal theory of how to best transform the optimization landscape. What we have seen here as an example is that machine learning now allows us to have a data-driven approach to optimization. So what we have done is we essentially have moved the complexity from the optimization step to the neural network training process. And once trained, the neural network can directly map the problem parameter to the optimized solution. So if you think of what mathematical algorithm is, a mathematical algorithm is basically a mapping from a problem instance to an optimized solution. So if you see many instances of this problem, you can potentially train a neural network to mimic the same mapping. So when in the testing stage, then a new, when a new problem comes in, then you can directly map to the optimized solution. So in other words, this task of optimization is turned into pattern matching. And the pattern matching is much faster, potentially, for a complex, uh, for a complex optimization problem. So uh, another way to think about it is that the neural network is now a universal model with large number of trainable parameters that can model any kind of algorithm. 
So one of the key to the success to, of, of using machine learning or using neural network to solve optimization problem is that you ought to match the structure of the neural network to the problem, to the problem structure. And this is really the key to success. So if you reflect a little bit on how we use machine learning to solve this initial alignment problem, we see that if we just use a fully connected neural network on every stage, we can already perform our performance state of art. So this is very good news. But using a fully connected neural network is probably not the best thing to do. You can potentially further improve this performance of this machine learning approach if you explore the problem structure. You see that this fully connected neural network maps the posterior distribution to the uh, sensing vector. But the complexity of computing the posterior distribution is high. And when you have multiple paths, for example, in the system, and the computation of posterior is actually impossible to do. So in the second half of the talk, let me ask the following question. Can we avoid the computation of the posterior distribution in order to save the complexity? That's the first question. The second is, can we further improve the performance by matching the neural network architecture to the problem structure? Okay. So it turns out that the answer to the both questions are yes. And we're going to show that if we uh, design a specific neural network for this problem, we can actually get even better performance. So let's think about active sensing problem in general to see what active sensing problems are. So the active sensing problem is about sequential query, query of the environment in order to find an optimized solution. So what we do is we sense the environment and you know, in, 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 in a series of, 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 of measurements and based on the received observation, we can adjust the way that we sense the environment. Okay? And after uh, multiple stages of the sensing, then we find the optimal solution according to the received, received observation. And this type of sequential active learning problem naturally arises in many, many uh, influence sensing and control settings. For example, for tree search, for sequential design experiments, uh, multi arm bandits is another example of this active sensing problem. Now, for these problems, the analytic solutions are generally not available, and the numerical solutions are generally computationally complex, and they are very hard to, hard to obtain. So really, what we're asking is that what is the best machine learning model for finding the optimal sequential sensing strategy efficiently? Okay? Can we design a machine learning model for this, specifically for the sensing application? No. This sensing application can be, um, sensing problem can be mathematically formulated, just as we have done for the uh, millimeter wave uh, initial alignment problem. That is, suppose we do have an environment op, uh, a parameterized a bit by this parameter theta. So what we're doing is we are observing this, this, uh, 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 this, this environment, uh, which is a function of the sensing vector wt and the, and the environment theta. Okay, so and the system ha potentially have additional stochastic parameters, let's, let's call that u of t. So we, we, um, uh, we design these sensing vector and take the observations. And then based on these multiple observations, then we design the next sensing vector, okay? And then finally, based on the entire history of, of the observations, we find the optimal, uh, optimal, um, optimal sensing, uh, sensing estimate. So one of the key problems of, of this is how do we design the next sensing vector w of t plus one based on the previous observations? Now you see that uh, a key problem here is that this, this observation act vector, its dimension actually grow over time, over the multiple stages. So if you have t stages, this, this, this observation y of one to t uh, uh, gets larger and larger as, as we progress for the sensing. Now in the previous uh, application of a pre previous solution to the millimeter wave sensing problem, we see that we can summarize the previous observation by using sufficient statistics, which is the posterior distribution of, 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 of the theta. But in general, it's difficult to compute this posterior distribution. So it would be ideal if we can design a neural network to automatically to, to, to discover what the sufficient statistics is. Okay. So this is really our motivation for designing this uh, general, to, for, for solving this general active sensing problem. So here is our strategy. So what we do is that instead of directing, uh, uh, so, okay, so, so, so let me go back to the, go back to the bit. So here, um, this, in this problem, we can estimate the, uh, the, 
we have a final estimate of theta. So this is one, one pos possible problem formulation for this active sensing. We can actually have a more a slightly more general problem formulation where we not only, uh, we, we don't necessarily want to directly estimate theta, but rather we want to design an action variable, control variable, which is a function of the observation and to achieve some objective, okay? So we can want to maximize some objective. So we just want to design this, this, this V. So again, in this design, we want to design the sensing vector in the next stage as a function of the previous observations. And finally, we want to design the control action here. So what we want to do is to propose a unified deep neural network, a deep learning framework to handle this general formulation over the, over the multiple stages. Now, again, the, the key uh, difficulty for designing neural network is the fact that this is why these observations grow over time. So we want a way of automatically discover what this state information is. We want to discover what the statistic, uh, statistic, uh, sufficient statistic is. Okay, so we want to tackle the problem that the dimension of the historical observation increase as the time index increase. So it's desirable to abstract the useful information about this historical observation into a state, state variable and to discover the, the, the state variable. That's what we want to do. And once the state variable is known, then we can uh, use a deep neural network to map the state into the optimized WT, optimized sensing vector. So the key question is really how to generate the state variable from the function of his, historical, uh, historical observations. So this is where uh, this, this LSTM comes in. So what we propose to do is to use a long-term short memory, long short-term memory architecture to, to capture the state. And this LSTM network is widely used for natural language processing to keep track of arbitrary laundry dependencies in the input sequence. So this is a sequential decision problem. So we need to understand the, the laundry dependencies between these sequence of decisions. So this is the mathematical formulation of the LSTM cell. So let me, let me draw this in a picture to, to show you what the LSTM looks like. So here's the LSTM cell. And the, the key variables are the cell state. So there's CT, it's called cell state. And we also have a hidden state called S of T. And the cell state and, and, and uh, this cell state CT and the hidden state ST are, are connected to each other in an intricate fashion. So it has a forgetting gate here, has input gate, and also has output gate. So this is one single LSTM cell. And this LSTM cell then will be concatenated with the LSTM cell in the next stage. So here our observation of the, of the environment is concatenated with a state as input to the LSTM cell. Then in order to design the next sensing vector, we use a DNN to map the state to the, uh, uh, to the, to the next sensing vector. And this sensing vector will result in the observation. This observation will be concatenated into the next, uh, next LSTM cell. Okay. So this is what LSTM uh, look like. The fact is that we're going to train this LSTM so that it will discover what's the best uh, formulation of the state. So in a sense, it's discovering the sufficient statistics in the problem. So how do we train this DNN? So what we do is we concatenate this LSTM cells over the multiple stages. So for example, we have 10 stages. We have this 10 LSTM cells and they're concatenated with each other. Then we consider this whole, uh, whole, whole uh, concatenated LSTM as a, as a very deep neural network. And our objective is either uh, uh, estimation of the channel parameter or a control action to, to maximize the utility, utility function. Then we can use stochastic gradient descent to train the parameters of this LSTM as well as this DNN for mapping the state to the, to the sensing vector, as well as this final DNN to map the state to the uh, uh, control action or the, or, the, uh, or the estimated parameter, okay? And further, we tie the parameters of this LSTM across the multiple stages so that they're, they're easier, easier to train. Okay, so this is our approach. And this can be uh, 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 applied to both the estimation of the state as well as the uh, uh, optimization of the control actions. So let's now apply this structure to our millimeter wave being alignment problem. So again, we have, um, we have a channel consists of now potentially a multiple path. So we have an uplink sensing stage. We want to design the sensing vector WT uh, through a single RF chain in order to understand where the channel is. Then based on the channel, we're going to want to design the downlink beamformer. Okay. 
So we can formulate the problem as that of minimizing the mean square error of estimating the angle of arrival. So this is one possible problem, problem formulation. Or we can, we can uh, formulate the problem as to design the beam forming vector in the downlink beam forming vector in order to maximize the beam forming gain. Okay, so this is an example of maximizing your utility function as a function uh, of, the, uh, of the observed channel in order to maximize the beam forming gain. Now, both of these problems are in the form of this generic active sensing problem discussed earlier. So we can, we can use the proposed LSTM approach for, for optimizing the mapping from the channel observation to, to, the, to the next sensing vector, as well as the final mapping to the uh, desired beamformer or to the, to the, to the, uh, to the estimate of the, of, of the channel. So here are some implementation details. We use an LSTM cell with 512 states. Then there are two uh, DNNs, one for mapping to the sensing vector, the other is the final DNN for mapping to the final, uh, final control action or the observe uh, of the estimate of the, of the observation. And uh, these are traditionally uh, uh, fully connected uh, DNNs, but this RSTM cell is really uh, the key part of, 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 of this program that allows us to keep track of the long-term dependency across the multiple observations. So here's uh, 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 how, how well this works. So the two light blue curve are what we had done previously, the DNN approach with, with uh, either known alpha, this is the solid curve with known alpha, or with unknown alpha, but using a common filter to track the alpha. So this purple curve, the purple solid curve, is this new uh, RSTM approach for estimating this, uh, estimating this angle arrival. So here, uh, this purple curve assumes that we don't know alpha, but we use LSTM to automatically discover what the sufficient statistics of the channel, of, of, the, of the estimation process is. Now you see that assuming the channel is known, we, uh, we, we all perform the previous DNN approach with where we estimate the alpha by another 5 dB, right? So, so in, in this proposed approach, we assume that the channel is not known. And in previously, we had to use a common filter to track the channel. So it turns out this proposed approach with unknown alpha does almost as well as the DNN approach with known alpha. In other words, we get the estimation alpha uh, for free. Now, this approach can be applied not only to coherent setting, but also to non-coherent setting. So for example, this is, let's assume that we uh, uh, here the single RF chain does not have the, uh, the does not estimate the angle, only estimate the magnitude of the observation. Then we can train the same neural network in the same way. Then uh, we can we can get uh, uh, very respectable results, even assuming that the observation is non-coherent. So now let's take a look at what this LSTM based deep neural network is actually doing. So here, what I'm plotting here is the posterior distribution of the AOA over the multiple stages, okay? And the corresponding, or corresponding designed sensing vector. So this is t equal to zero, t equal to one, two, three, for example. So, the, so here we're assuming that the angle comes from minus 60 degree to 60 degree, and the true angle is at 9.96 degree, okay? So this is just one example. At the beginning, the posterior distribution of the angle is arbitrary. So we don't know where they are. So we have uniform distribution across the minus 60 to 60. And the, then the corresponding designed uh, uh, sensing vector is plotted here. So really we're just doing a fishing, fishing expedition of trying to figure out where the sensing vector is. So we have sort of no idea where it is. So we do this, we design this, this very broad sensing vector. But based on this sensing vector, we already have some idea. So if you compute the posterior distribution, then we have some idea where this uh, angle is, you see it's not, the true angle is actually here. So, uh, so our posterior is not very accurate. But based on this posterior, we can already design another sensing vector to sort of fine tune the direction so that we can get a better idea of what the AOA is. And based on these two sensing vectors, now we have a better uh, idea of where the uh, angle arrival is. Then we design another corresponding uh, sensing vector we get even better idea where the angle is, and then we design another sensing vector. So eventually the sensing vector will converge to sort of have a sharp peak on where the uh, uh, true angle is. True angle is 9.96. And the posterior distribution will converge very sharply to where this angle arrival is. You see that this neural network 
is trained in arbitrary fashion, right? We, we're not telling it what, what the, the state description is, but it's doing very sensible things. So the, the design sensing vector and the designed posterior can be easily interpreted. So this is really an interpretable uh, kind of uh, deep neural network that we have designed. So now this approach can be uh, easily generalized to, 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 to multiple different settings. So, for, so here's another setting where we assume the sensing vector uh, satisfy the constant modulated constraints. For example, we can only have phase control in these sensing vectors. So it turns out that this DNN approach does uh, very well also, and it's uh, have a similar performance as compared to a previous approach uh, with, with known alpha. So we get this uh, sense, uh, tracking of alpha for free. Right. So this is uh, an, another example. So here's a, here's a multi-path example where we have multiple paths. So previous path, in, in, in this event, so we assume that we have only a single path. If a multiple path, sort of none of the previous uh, benchmarks actually works with multiple path, and the best you can do uh, in, the, in the previous literature is just use the OMP. But with the neural network approach, we can get significantly better uh, MSC performance as compared to the previous uh, capacitor sensing based approach. Here is another example where we do not look at the estimation error as a metric, but rather we look at down, downing beamformer as, as the metric. So here we have a three path system and the, each of these angles come from minus 60 degree to 60, 60 degrees. And we look at the downing beamformer design using this LSTM approach. And the ultimate performance limit is the, this, this blue curve, which assumes a perfect CSI. Then if you use the traditional approach of um, uh, of using uh, OMP to do a channel estimation followed by maximum ratio combining, this is what you have. This is the, uh, the, the, the curve you, you, uh, this is the curve you have. Now if you use random sensing vectors, you can already do better than, than, than explicit channel estimation. So this is the green curve, but the best performance is uh, obtained when you, when you actually design these sensing vectors. So this, 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 this red curve is if you design the sensing vector using DNN. And this purple curve is if you design these sensing vectors in an active fashion. So this red curve is if you design the sensing vector uh, 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 over, over the multiple stages, but they are fixed. They're not a function of the previous uh, observations. But if you take this active sensing approach, this is where you get the best, get, get the best performance. Okay. All right. So, so this, uh, this is one example of an active sensing and why active sensing is, is, a, is an interesting problem and, and why deep neural network can, can be useful if we're solving this problem. So in the final couple of minutes of, of this talk, I'm gonna talk about the application to refer, refer, intelligent reflective surface and to see that active sensing also has a role to play there. So here's another application where active sensing is, is, is interesting. Intelligent surface is a device that allows a transmitter to direct its, its electromagnetic radiation toward the receive, uh, intended receiver uh, by reflecting its electromagnetic uh, radiation um, in, 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 a, in a specific uh, fashion. So this is most useful when the direct link from the transmitter receiver is blocked. So what you can do is you can adjust the elements of this RS in, in a way such that the electromagnetic radiation is, is directed to the intended receiver. Now, in order to implement the, this RS system, you need to understand the channel first, okay? So typically what you do is you transmit a pilot signal from the receiver to the transmitter so that the transmitter learns about the channel, then based on channel reciprocity, then you design the, um, the beamformer at the RS so that the, 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 the uh, beamforming can, can be maximized from the transmitter to the receiver. Now in the channel sensing stage, you see you can also change the RS coefficients, right? So this, is, this, this can actually be formulated as an active sensing problem in the sense that you can have the receiver transmit multiple pilot signals. Then based on the received pilot signal that you have received so far, you can adjust this RS coefficient in the sensing stage so that you can get better and better look at the channel. So you see that in this RS channel estimation problem, this is also an active sensing problem in the sense that this, this, this sensing, uh, uh, you, you're really measuring a high dimensional channel based on low dimensional observation at the, at the transmitter, but you can 
change the direction direction in which this 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 channel is being sensed. Right. So the, you can formulate a problem of maximizing the overall beamform gain, the downlink, as a function of how you do the sensing. That is, in every sensing stage, I'm going to change this RS in in the specific direction so that my channel gets my channel estimation error gets gets uh, channel gets my channel estimation gets better and better. So this is why this adaptive channel sensing problem is actually a sense is actually a, a, an, an active learning problem because you have a controller that that's capable of controlling this RS coefficient, so you can do this in the sensing stage as well as the as well as the downlink transmission stage. So you can use the same LSTN framework to do this sensing uh, to do the active sensing problem, and here is uh, implementation of of this LSTN uh, network. We again use an uh, LSTM cells with 500, 512 uh, states. And the channel model here is, is a Ryshin channel, um, which means that it has a, a strong uh, line of sight component. So here's an RS coefficient, a, a configuration of eight by eight, a rectangular array. So here is the, uh, the, the performance of this active sensing. So again, this blue curve is, is the perfect CSI case. Now the traditional approach is to first to do a channel to, to estimate the channel, then you 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 match the phase of the channel in order to maximize the beamforming gain. So this is the performance you will get uh, the beamforming uh, beamforming gain as a function of the number of sensing stages. So this is the traditional channel estimation based approach. Now a significant uh, performance improvement can already be obtained if you bypass channel estimation and directly design the beamformer based on the received pilot. So this is the approach that's um, proposed in one of our previous work. So, but in that work, we assume that the, 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 the sensing vector at the RS is random, is, is set randomly. If you set the sensing vectors in, if you, uh, to, to be adapted to the channel, you can do much better. So the, 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 the red curve and the purple curve are these adaptive channel of sensing, of sensing design. This red curve is if the sensing vectors are adapted to the channel realization. And this, this purple curve is when the sensing vector is, is not only being adapted to the channel environment, but also be active um, in a sequential fashion. That is based on the received uh, observation, I actively design the next sensing vector and do this sequentially so that I can get a better and better look at the channel. You see that this active sensing actually performs the best. Um, we get something like one or two dB performance gain as compared to uh, a, 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 a non-active but adaptive approach. Okay, so let me conclude this talk. So sensing will be an integral part of all future wireless communication system design. There's no question about this. And this is why we're in this integrated sensing and communications uh, seminar series. So the point of this talk is that active sensing is an important problem in practice. And it's an interesting problem theoretically. We saw that deep learning can tackle uh, complex mathematical optimization problems more efficiently than traditional optimization approaches. So we saw that deep learning gives a viable data-driven methodology for designing uh, active sensing strategies. We give two examples. One is the initial alignment problem for millimeter wave communications. And the other is the sensing matrix design for, for uh, reflection alignment in RS systems. In both cases, we see that active sensing has, has, uh, has, is, 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 is highly beneficial. And the, the main point of, uh, uh, of how to apply a deep learning for sensing of communication up, uh, applications are, are really uh, the, 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 the following points. We want to make sure that the learning objective should match the application objective. That's very important. And we also see that it's beneficial to bypass the explicit channel modeling and explicit channel estimation, really to design the sensing strategy or designing the, the parameters you want to estimate directly based on the receive, receive the pilots. And this is beneficial. And the most important lesson is, is really that you should, you, should, you should design the neural network architecture to match the problem structure. So here we have a sequential problem. That's why this strong short-term memory structure is ideally suited uh, for this application. Okay, so this talk is based on uh, these two papers. I just want to put in the reference here, as well as again to acknowledge my students and postdocs who are the main contributors to, 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 to this work, and both of them uh, are available on our, our archive.
Okay, so thank you very much. This uh, concludes uh, my presentation. Okay, thanks, uh, Professor Yu, for the very wonderful talk. And we have uh, received uh, some questions. I think uh, the first question is from uh, Fernando Petrata on the uh, bike uh, back propagation. So, Fernando, can you please unmute, unmute yourself and ask? Hi, yes. Um, so thank you very much for the uh, wonderful presentation. Um, I'm curious about how to actually train the, the network that maps the internal state from the LSTM to the uh, beamforming vectors. Um, is it like in the in the um, uh, figure there was like a plot a, a cloud that was uh, labeled with environment? Like is that uh, like the dynamics of that environment? Are they provided to the network so that it can back propagate through it? Or otherwise, like which kind of target signal um, do you try to minimize there? Yes, 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 yes. So we have to provide the, we have to assume that the, the, the statistics of the channel realizations are known. So we, 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 we run many examples of this channel. So eventually the neural network will learn what the statistics of the channel is and to design its uh, uh, being forming vectors according to the channel statistics. So uh, for sure, we need, to, we, need, we need to provide the statistics to in the, in the, tra in the training process. So we generate many samples of this environment in the in the training process. This is how we generate lots of data. Yes, but um, even with many samples, my question is uh, usually like in order to learn the weights for that um, L layer DNN, um, you would need to take the derivative of the final output with respect to this uh, hidden state of the LSTM. And for that, like, you need to also know in this case, for example, the derivative of this or gradient of this yt with respect to wt. So um, yeah, is the network able to calculate those gradients in order to, to be trained or? Um, yeah, so we take a mini batch approach. We take a particular weights. So we do many uh, realization in the environment. Then mm -hmm. it gives a particular uh, uh, objective function, uh, the, 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 the loss function. Then you can back propagate to see that if you change the weights of this neural network, mm -hmm. how much better would you do with respect to this mini batch? So you have to generate many samples to, 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 to summarize what the effect of the uh, neural network weights on the final objective function is. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I think I get it. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you. Okay. So uh, we have a second question from uh, Pete uh, Tioka. So he's uh, uh, he he's he's not traveling, so cannot uh, speak. So I'll ask uh, uh, on behalf of him. So he's he asked, uh, is the proposed active sensing robust when the environments are different between the training and the testing stages? Yeah, so this is a good question. So what you want to do is to train this over lots of different environments to make sure that the neural network has seen uh, many examples of the environment in order to be robust. So this is a typical thing that you would do for neural network training uh, for speech recognition, for example. You want to make sure that you've seen many different kinds of speakers uh, in order to be, be able to recognize speeches from many speakers. So this is a typical uh, difficulty for, for, for using a neural network uh, approach. But let me say that if you try to do robust optimization, the traditional optimization uh, uh, so framework, that's, that's even more difficult because then you would need some kind of statistical model of, of the variations of the channel. Um, and typically that would lead to very difficult uh, mathematical and uh, mathematical optimization problems, difficult stuff. So it's for robust optimization, it's actually much easier to just to generate many different samples of the environment in order to make sure that the final solution is robust. Okay, thanks, uh, Professor Yu. So actually myself has, uh, so I have two uh, questions about uh, uh, this work and uh, some potential future extensions. Uh, so the first question is that actually many uh, sensing problems, the behavior of the object to be sensed may uh, follow some specific models. So for example, recently, uh, Chrysos and I, uh, we have done quite a lot, lot, quite a lot of works 
on uh, integrated sensing communication for like uh, vehicular communication, uh, vehicular networks. So the vehicles may have some specific kinematic models depending on the traffic conditions and the roadway geometry. So how can we leverage this model in, in your proposed framework? Yeah, that's, that's a good question. In the sense that we already leverage this model and we designed this, we assume that this, this, this channel is of a, a, a particular form. It has a, uh, uh, have a fading coefficient, it has a mathematical model that describes for the angle arrival, how that relates to the channel. So if you have a vehicle to vehicle communication scenario, you will have you will have a similar model, either line of sight model, or there should maybe find a number of reflections for another vehicle. So, so in a sense that we already designed this, uh, assuming this model. Uh, if you want to be completely model agnostic, then the amount of training needed to to, to design the final solution will be uh, cons considerably more difficult. So, so in the sense that we, this is already a model driven approach. I mean, it's a data driven approach, but accounting for the model, that's what I meant. I think Chrysos has, has some something to ask. So please, Chrysos. Uh, no, just a comment uh, on this very topic that you asked, Fan. Uh, I think it would be interesting to maybe uh, see how you can model the evolution of channel H based on the mobility of the user. And, and I think right. that would be the connection uh, from what Fan says to what you're showing here, uh, Wei. And, and maybe right. the geometry is difficult and maybe learning has a role there. To, to play. That's right. So these are two, two separate things. So here we assume the channel is fixed and we're looking at active learning. We're, trying to, you know, we're, we're looking at the channel multiple times in order to, 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 to figure out what the channel is. Now, if the channel changes over time, for example, this angle arrival has a, a time evolution um, uh, 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 over time, then this is a separate model that we need to track the uh, the, the changing of the angle of arrival or changing of the fading coefficient. So that's a, that's a, that's a, a additional layer of, of, of tracking that we, uh, we, 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 we will have to do. So you can potentially also use sort of the RSTM approach to do this. And in fact, I think uh, when I saw one paper, conference paper, that does exactly this. Okay. Thank you very much, Professor. Yeah, I think uh, there's another uh, audience. So uh, still the uh, Sud, can you please uh, unmute yourself? Um, yeah, hi. Uh, I also have one question, please. Um, it's actually the same question as uh, someone else uh, asked earlier about the back propagation. So this is actually quite a question for me as well. Uh, so I just wanted to ask, would it be possible for you to actually maybe uh, provide a GitHub code for this so we can actually see what's happening? This, this is very difficult to understand in terms of what's happening in the, in the network. Yeah, we'd be happy to. We'd be happy to. Yes. Okay, that, that would be really helpful. Thank you very much. And thanks for the interesting presentation. Feel free to send me an email. I typically post that on my own website. OK, Thank so uh, so I have a final question again uh, for myself. So uh, I, uh, I'm very interested about, uh, so you, you have mentioned about bypassing this uh, channel estimation stage so you can directly map the, uh, let's see, the, uh, sen uh, the, the, the observation or the sensing uh, signals to a communication strategy, let's see. So here you map the uh, sensing results to, a, let's see, a beamformer, right? So uh, actually in many, uh, let's see, integrated sensing and communication scenario, we're also thinking about to, to bypassing the uh, channel estimation stage, but instead we're not, using the conventional channel estimation, but we're using a radar to, uh, you know, sense the, let's see, sense, sense the environment. So this will be rather different. So your sensor results will be rather different from the, uh, uh, let's see, the conventional channel estimation. So conventionally we use, uh, we uh, design a communication strategy directly based on the communication channel uh, estimated results. But if we are going to use, let's see, so the so-called active sensing, so radar is actually doing this active sensing. So you transmit the sensor signal and uh, it reflects it uh, back to the radar. And uh, then based on that results, how can we design, uh, let's see, a communication strategy by using this framework? So I, I, uh, I'm not sure if I uh, make this clear. 
So, so bypass and channel estimation is has has huge benefit. There's there's no question about that. I'm, yeah, I'm, right, 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 right. I'm happy to report that. So here's an example. We if you split the channel, estimate the channel, you you do you do very poorly as compared to a case that you bypass channel estimation. And the reason for that is that the 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 traditional uh, channel estimation process assumes a particular model of of the channel has certain number of parameters. Then you try to estimate those parameters. But not all parameters are of equally importance. Some of the parameters are not not important in terms of being designing a subsequent uh, beamforming strategy. So th th there's no way if you for you to know a priori which which parameters are more important than the others. That's why if you can directly map the receive signal to the to the communication strategy, you get you get a huge performance gain already. You're asking, I think, what you're asking is how do we apply this to the radar uh, setting? So, yeah, so the so so how can we uh, use the radar sensed results to facilitate, it, you know, the communication strategy design? Yeah, so to me, there's no difference between radar sensing and the channel estimation. I mean, at the end of the day, you're sensing a particular channel. If you use this particular radar waveform to sensing sensing the channel, you get certain uh, output, and that output will be a function of the channel parameters. So if you use a different sequence um, uh, to, to sense the channel, you also get some information on the channel. So at the end of the day, it's, the, it, it's about uh, how, how, many, how many different dimensions in the channel that, that you're, you're exploring and how well that you know, you know the channel as a result. So you can use whatever sensing strategy that you want to employ. And based on the output of the sensing, design a mapping from the output of sensing stage to the to the control action to the actionable things that you want to design and that can be typically trained using your network so that's that's what i'm proposing and some sensing strategy may be more efficient than the others so that's when the statistical channel comes in so, so, so suppose you already know certain parts of the channel then you know that you should look at this part of the channel more carefully than the other channels so that will affect performance but that's assuming okay. that you have some knowledge of the channel distribution, then you have to take advantage of that. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. you can always design this mapping using a data-driven fashion to, 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 to get what you wanted to, to design at the end. So, so actually, we're wondering if we're going to use radar sensing, so com uh, uh, compared to the, you know, the conventional channel estimation. So uh, we, we typically call this, uh, so for, for radar sensing, we typically call this uh, device-free sensing. Uh, for channel estimation, we call it uh, device-based sensing because it is cooperative. And for radar sensing, it's, it is non-cooperative. So we wonder if there is some performance, uh, let's see, performance gap between the uh, these two, uh, you know, strategies. So uh, device-based or device-free. So so let's uh, that is actually uh, some open problems that we want to explore. Yeah. So that is one of my comments on this. I see. What, I'm not sure what you mean by device free. It means so entirely device, based on PlayStation. Device based means that uh, the sensed object actually has, uh, you know, let's see, a communication device attached to that uh, uh, object. And device free means that there's no such communication device on that object. I see. So just based on reflection from the from the object. Yeah. Right. 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 Yeah. Right. Yeah, so we um, wonder so, if there should be some performance uh, gap between these uh, two strategies. Right, right. Uh, depends on the channel model, depends on the situation. Depends on, <laughs> there depends on many different things. But um, in principle, it's possible to do. But then depending on the the, the model, uh, the two, I mean, there's going to be difference between the two models to, 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 to give you the performance difference. Yeah, yeah, right. OK, I think uh, that would be enough for all the questions. And uh, thank you again, Professor Yu, for this uh, very interesting talk. And uh, we hope to uh, uh, see you in our future events. And also, we would love to uh, host you again in our future webinar series. Thank you very much.